Welcome, everyone. Welcome, audience members, and welcome, people uh, in cyberspace. Uh, welcome, partners in health. I know you are all watching tonight. Uh, Joya, hello, and thank you. Um, I know Tracy Kidder might be out there as well. Um, welcome to this very special event. Before we begin, a few logistical matters. Restrooms are at the rear of the auditorium on each side, and uh, we also have two at the left of the entrance hall, my left here. We have six emergency exits, two in the outer hall, two at the rear of the auditorium, and two at the side of the stage. Next week, November 27th, we will be presenting Dr. Michael Fine. He is medical director of the Rhode Island Department of Health to address health care needs in Rhode Island. For this evening's presentation, we would like to thank South County Hospital, the University of Rhode Island Office of the Provost, and the John Hazen White Center for Ethics and Public Service for sponsoring this important event. Thank you so very much. My name's Roger Lebrun. My name is Roger Lebrun. I'm a faculty member in the College of the Environment and Life Sciences, and I'm one of the coordinators of the 2012 University of Rhode Island Honors Colloquium on Healthcare Change, Health, Politics, and Money. We've been examining how to improve health care at the individual, the state, the national, and the international level. At the state level, our First Lady Stephanie Chafee spoke to us last week and address the issue of women's reproductive rights in the state of Rhode Island. And thank you, First Lady, for that. It was very well received. It was just superb. <laughs> at the uh, international level, we partnered with the Multicultural Center at the University of Rhode Island, and we brought Dr. Joya Mukherjee, the Medical Director of Partners in Health, to examine health care disparities around the world. And with su support from the provost's office, the common reading program at the University of Rhode Island assigned 3,200 incoming students to read Mountains Beyond Mountains, the quest of Dr. Paul Farmer, a man who would cure the world. In addition, we brought the author of this book, Tracy Kidder, here to the University of Rhode Island to inaugurate the colloquium series. And tonight, we have the great fortune to actually have Dr. Farmer with us to talk about Haiti after the earthquake. All right, thank you for being here. <laughs> Medical anthropologist and physician Paul Farmer's founding director of Partners in Health, an international nonprofit organization that provides direct health care services and has undertaken research and advocacy activities on behalf of those who are sick, and living in poverty. Dr. Farmer is professor and chair of the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School. He's also chief of the Division of Global Health Equity at Brigham and Women's Hospital and the UN Deputy Special Envoy for Haiti under Special Envoy President Bill Clinton. Dr. Farmer and his colleagues in the US and in Haiti, Peru, Russia, Rwanda, Lesotho, and Malawi have pioneered novel community-based treatment strategies that demonstrate the delivery of high-quality health care in resource-poor settings. Dr. Farmer has written extensively on health, human rights, and the consequences of social inequity. Most recently, uh, his book, uh, Haiti After the Earthquake, has been published. Dr. Farmer is recipient of numerous awards, the Margaret Mead Award uh, from the American Anthropological Association, the Outstanding International Physician Award from the AMA, MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, and his PIH colleagues, the Hilton Humanitarian Prize. He's a member of the Institute of Medicine, National Academy of Sciences, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. During this Thanksgiving week, we are all very, very grateful to have Dr. Paul Farmer with us. It's my pleasure and my privilege to introduce the man who would cure the world, Dr. Paul Farmer. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Um, I'm hoping it's, it, it's not going to be a tough crowd. Um, I've, I've stacked the audience here at UI with, a, with people from Brown and other suspect institutions who, I, who will get my back if you don't like my talk. Actually, I was a little worried that I wouldn't have uh, too much to add, given that you've had already Joya Mukherjee, who is, I hope many of you have were here when she spoke. She, she also received an honorary degree from URI, terrific physician and great friend and co-worker for 13 years. And I know that you had also uh, Tracy Kidder here, who really really took years to try and understand the work that we're doing. Uh, and so you've, you've, you've heard from more eloquent spokespeople. But I'm going to I'm going to talk a little bit about the earthquake. I have to say that for some months after the earthquake, it was very difficult for me to do. Uh, I just didn't really feel uh, comfortable uh, doing it. And it's really only recently, and, and it's been helpful to write some things about it. I was talking to a group of the honor students earlier uh, about sometimes the ways to analyze failure and difficult uh, experiences uh, do involve uh, do involve reading and writing about them. And I know that sounds what you'd expect a professor to say, but it's true. So I would like to thank all of you who've been reading this work for taking the trouble to do that, um, not just about the earthquake, but about some of the hardest problems that we have before us as a species. And, uh, and, and that includes health disparities, of course. Also have some clinical colleagues here, nurses and physicians who I've been lucky enough to work with at the Brigerman in Haiti, and I want to thank you for being there, uh, being there at those places and being here with me today. So let me go into um, uh, just a, a personal reflection again, and I, I'm not even sure that I like that way of approaching a problem that's really not about, I mean, an earthquake in Haiti or problems like these are not about us, the speakers and those who, even those who are practicing uh, medicine. But uh, to complement what you've, who, the people you've already heard from, I'm going to talk about my experience. And it, it really was uh, based in some ways on failure. And as I said to the students, uh, URI students earlier today, I think it takes a long time to talk about failure, um, especially for young, accomplished people like the ones I met today. We're really socialized to talk about our successes whether they be academic or otherwise. But failure is an important part of uh, experience, and I think that's true in all endeavors. The one I'll mention is having been very lucky enough, uh, lucky enough, I went to Haiti right after graduating from college. Uh, but again, there's a lot of serendipity involved. I had applied for a Fulbright, Fulbright grant to go to Africa. I wanted to go to Senegal. And uh, it didn't really occur to me that I might not get the grant. Uh, so that was a, a good object lesson, uh, getting my little very thin envelope from the Fulbright people. Thank you very much. Not that I'm still bitter about it. <laughs> so, um, and, uh, and plan B uh, involved going to Haiti. And it, of course, it was a, well, in some ways the most important thing that ever happened to me as, as a student or a physician was, was ending up in Haiti. And uh, again, it was a very tough experience. And I, for a decade probably, or many years, talked about that first year as if it were somehow magical and illuminating. But it was actually really hard work, and I'm not sure in working, I was a volunteer of, uh, then as now, working in a, a, a one-doctor clinic in the town of Mirbalé, and I'll ask you to remember the name of that town, Mirbalé. Um, and I'm not sure in the course of that year that we did much, of good, much good for any of the patients. We didn't have a laboratory. We didn't have a list of essential medicines. It was all fee for service. People lining up and you know for hours and hours to see one physician who had nothing other than his own smarts, which were considerable, and a stethoscope. And uh, it was very um, poor quality medical care, and not because that that person was a poor quality physician, uh, not at all. It's because he did not have a health system behind him. Uh, or in that, it, nor did any of there was only one nurse, and I'm not even sure she was an RN, um, and so that just didn't have a system that could help them deliver much of anything. And so there were occasional cases, maybe someone coming coming in shuddering with malaria 
where we got the diagnosis right and had the medications, or someone with acute bacterial pneumonia was treated correctly or had a fractured arm that we could set. Um, don't worry, I wasn't doing orthopedics. That was the doctor. Um, but really, mostly, it was, it was care that after a year of hard work, um, I'm not sure that it did much of any good. So my experience a few months later, or really a couple of months after uh, arriving there, in a squatter settlement where there was no clinic at all was much better than the experience I had working in a clinic that was already built. And, uh, and that in and of itself took me many years to understand that it was the absence of a, med a bad medical system uh, that allowed us to start again. We made a lot of mistakes. I, I was uh, looking for pictures from 1983. Um, and and the, why, why would you have a squatter settlement? M many of you, student, the students here, have read the Red Kidder's account or one of my scintillating books. People come up to me and say, oh, I read your book. And I said, oh, which one? Women, Poverty, and AIDS? Is that the one that grabbed your attention? <laughs> they, it takes a while for people to get the joke, but nobody reads my books. Why is that, Roger? How come all URI students aren't required to read the threat of global threat of drug-resistant tuberculosis? <laughs> so anyway, I went to Conge in 1984. I was 24 years old. And uh, it's a squatter settlement because there was a hydroelectric dam. And you can see in the background of this picture that there's a reservoir back there. So the people up on this stony hillside um, were really f flooded out of their uh, valley. And they had no land. And, and that, of course, is significant because this, these are landless, uh, landless peasants. In other words, they, their, their income came from the thing that they lost. So it was very difficult uh, for them. And this went on for a long time. And we got there. I, the we, of course, well, I was 24, as I said, and just starting uh, that. I would later start that year at Harvard Medical School. The we was Haitians, and I was the crasher on, at the party. Uh, it was a team of patients. I'm proud to tell you, by the way, that uh, almost 30 years later, I still work with the same group of people. And uh, we built not only buildings, which were not even well designed, although they're pretty well built, we would later discover. Um, we built not only buildings, but we built relationships and friendships and, and working relationships that endure to this day. And that's something also that I think we can learn a lot from, not from our experience, but just in general, the need to have long-term engagement. I was talking with a faculty member earlier tonight about how difficult it is when we have this kind of ADD in development work. Um, I, I, I'm, I consider myself credibly as having ADD, so I'm allowed to say that. But everybody has attention deficit disorder in this field. You know, you think you can go in for a short amount of time. It, it may take, in, in some settings, and I'm not talking just about Haiti, many years to see the kind of uh, effect that we want. So I'll give an example that, that you'll see in this next image. So this is more or less 1984. That was the year that we built the clinic. Again, built it incorrectly. Had to tear it, tear it down and build it again. But there you can see there a school and, uh, and that was built a little, uh, just before I, I got there, and uh, no trees. And again, as we were thinking today, I was I'm, uh, here with one of my medical students who was pointing out to the URI students that the innovation in this work is really, it's not in discovering new treatments or uh, new medications, it's in delivering the services. So the innovation here was to start providing modern medical services, again, some not so good, in a place where there, was no, there were no trees and people were living in temporary shelters. Now, is it because there are no trees there because trees won't grow in Haiti? Or, of course not. Trees do grow in Haiti. But in order to grow the trees, they have to stop cutting them down. In order to stop cutting them down, they have to have alternative fuel sources. And I'm going to return to fuel sources at the, uh, at the end of this. So this is the same place just, you know, some many years later. Same valley, same squatter settlement, reforested and, uh, and with modern medical facilities. Again, not as well designed as they could have been. But, and some of you in this room, many, several people here tonight have actually uh, visited us in Haiti. Um, so that was our first experience as partners in health, was learning that you can build infrastructure in difficult places. You can reforest them. You can work with local communities 
uh, to, to improve on the quality of basic health delivery. And we've spread over the years, last 25 years, this is the 25th anniversary of Partners in Health we're celebrating this, mo this month. And we uh, have gone from Haiti to back to our own country, to other places in Latin America, uh, to the former Soviet Union and to settings uh, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, and I'll mention a couple of these. And our MO has been this. Now, get ready, all of you students, you may need to take notes. This is really complicated. I said earlier uh, that I was hoping to win a Nobel Prize for my discovery that the treatment for malnutrition is called food. <laughs> but so it is with, <clears throat> with this uh, really innovative system, which is pretty obvious, really, if you think about it. If you're going into territory that, where people haven't received health services, it's not enough to just build a hospital, nor is it enough to focus on community-based care of chronic disease. Um, nor would you want to deliver all the care in either a hospital or a, a, someone's house. You'd want clinics as well. And that's the system, more or less, that we've tried to be part of. And again, it, partnership was the key word in the beginning. You can't do this unless you're willing to make partnerships, to forge partnerships. And, uh, and I, I'm going to talk a little bit about accompaniment. I was saying, again, I'm going to keep going back, Catherine, to our discussion, that one of the words we've used, learned from the Haitians, is accompaniment. Uh, that is, it's not just about going in and telling people what to do or even hearing what to do. It's about walking together to achieve social goals. And that term is applicable. And this is a beautiful picture taken by a friend of mine, Laurie Wynn, in Rwanda, not Haiti, of a, of a community health worker visiting a, a patient. The, all, all three of these pictures are, are, in fact, from Rwanda. But that process doesn't have to only happen between a health worker and a patient. It can be between a community at URI, say, and Haiti. It can be between people at a, at a place like this one uh, looking out for each other. Accompaniment is, a, is an elastic term, uh, but a very useful one. I'll go back to that as well. And then uh, you, you see the image of, uh, I, I, I've said before, this is a, a new hospital we've built in Rwanda. The, it looks so lovely that it looks like a, an artist's rendering, but it is not. It is a photograph. Um, and, uh, and that hospital opened uh, a year and a half ago. And uh, last summer, we uh, uh, inaugurated in that same hospital the first comprehensive cancer care center, probably in rural Africa. Now, the reason I bring that up is, is that, we, again, we can't have this either-or mentality, prevention versus care, and that's true of cancer, AIDS. I'm going to talk a little bit about AIDS very briefly. Um, and uh, we, we can't set up competition where really what we need is collaboration. And that is a, one of the key themes uh, that I've seen in global health, but also uh, in contemplating health care crises in, our, in, in this country as well. Now, uh, a word about accompaniment beyond what I just said. Uh, this, this is, to me, sums it up. This, is, this patient happens to be one of my patients um, who is in the summer of 99 dying of AIDS in her little village. She'd gone off to Port-au-Prince. This is a, a, not a new story. It's a new pathogen, but not a new story. Gone off to Port-au-Prince, came back sick uh, to die. And you know what we like to say in medicine. When, every time I say medicine, by the way, I mean nursing and clinical services as well. And I'm not saying that just because the first lady is uh, a nurse. I'm saying because we can't do anything but without the teams that we that we uh, can constitute with community health workers and with, with people who would build hospitals. Accompaniment, again, is a great term. So what we like to say in medicine when someone's dying of a treatable disease is stop dying already. Yeah, that was supposed to be a little funny. <laughs> so stop dying already and, you know, take your medicines. And, of course, to say take your medicines to someone, you actually have to have the medicines on hand. And, uh, and but one year later, um, the same patient uh, is now has gained 26 pounds, actually less than a year. It was uh, within uh, two or three months. You know, you're dying of a wasting disease like AIDS and you have the, uh, the treatment. It's not the best treatment in the world. It's not curative, but pretty effective. Uh, and of course, people bounce back. I've seen it again and again a thousand times, and not just with AIDS, but with other uh, proper treatments. So there's the model of care. Like I said, it's very complicated, so you might have to take notes. Her health worker kind of a stern lady, I must say. Um, 
And there's the model of care coming to visit. Uh, and then later, of course, the patient is something beyond a patient. She then became a health worker herself and a health educator. And there she is 10 years later giving a talk at a small community-based college in Cambridge, Massachusetts called Harvard. <laughs> anyway, the day before, I asked her if she wanted to go over her remarks, speaking in front of a thousand people at Sanders Theater. And I said, you know, did you want to go over this with me? And she said, oh, no, I'm not nervous about it. Anyway, and she just changed the subject. And she didn't look nervous. That's all this stuff is on tape, too. It was streamed live and recorded. So that's the, that's the secret sauce, those two slides. That's what a couple of my colleagues, and I think Joya used that term. She uses a lot, the secret sauce. Is you need a system, and then in the system, you put the notion of accompaniment together with people who have something and people who need things, and all of us do at some point or another, and, and invest in that system. And that's what makes this work a little bit different from some. It is an intensive investment. And now let me just go back to the big picture again. I'm going to skip ahead um, th these TB outcomes uh, and talk. This actually, s then the, your governor, then senator, uh, it was really h uh, helpful in this effort. I'm not sure Stephanie Chafee is still here, but this, there she is. But this, uh, I have a, we have a great debt to people who push forward massive investments in global health equity, and even using terms like that. So here's the problem. AIDS, by this, this year, you look at the numbers on the bottom, had become the leading infectious killer of young adults in the world. But there were no strategies out there to either move these treatments, diagnostics or treatments, to those who needed them most, nor was there funding to do so. All that changed very rapidly uh, about, uh, just over 10 years ago. Um, right, right around 10 years ago. And there's a little code in here, and you don't have to know all this, but I can tell you, we started fighting for these patients to have therapy in part because I was going between the Brigham and Haiti, between Harvard and Haiti, Harvard and Haiti. On the one end of the scale, we were saying to patients, one end of that trajectory, we were saying to patients, you got to take these medicines. These are going to save your life. They're going to change your lives. And on the other, people were saying, can we get those medicines? So to argue that it is cost-effective and sustainable in one setting but not in the other, it's really not tenable in the modern world. And I, I have no doubt that there are people in this audience today who are already accustomed to these equity arguments. Now, to make them so mainstream requires substantial investments. And that happened not when we started treating this uh, small cohort of patients. We got our first grant from... Uh, Open Society Institute uh, for this treatment program in 1998. It was probably an MSF right around the same time, uh, Doctors Without Borders working in South Africa. Those were probably the first two uh, treatment programs that integrated treatment and care, uh, prevention in the developing world, where, as I told you, AIDS had already become the leading infectious killer of young adults. But it really was not until a, a, an effort called PEPFAR, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, where the U.S. government made a massive commitment to introduce treatment and to integrate it with prevention, that we had a chance, we doctors and nurses had a chance of saving the lives, not of thousands, but of millions of people, and also of preventing millions of new infections. And I can think of a few things, but this is, of course, another before and after picture um, of a patient who some of you may have met. He's, he's kind of a, uh, he's a, a very interesting young fellow. Um, he had never been out of Haiti, and, and uh, I, he went to an AIDS conference with us in Canada some years ago, a big, giant AIDS conference. And um, I, I was listening to one of my colleagues, uh, a Haitian physician, talking to him, because he'd never been on a plane or in an escala on an escalator or an elevator. And I was curious. I'd flown in from Rwanda, not Haiti. I wanted to hear what the doctor was going to say to the, his patient. And he was leaning over. He was, he was explaining, well, this, this card here, this opens the door. It's actually a key. And the patient's saying, okay, I get it. And he said, and then you've got to do this. And that. But the most important thing, and I was leaning over listening, he said, the most important thing is don't open the mini bar. <laughs> so the things you learn in global health. I'm going to put that into the 
Harvard Medical School curriculum. <laughs> so this, this changed a lot of things. The PEPFAR support, the US, the US government support changed a lot of things, not just for Haiti. Let me show you how it worked when we, you planned it out right. What we did, and again, I'd, I, I, I want to I thank uh, the First Lady, who's uh, been a patron of this work. We said, OK, let's, we can have vertical programs, AIDS program, but we need to integrate them into the problems that everybody has in their lives. You know, if, if 2 or 3% of the population has AIDS, what about all the rest of people who don't have AIDS and who still need basic medical services? Can we use this money to strengthen uh, health platforms, as the jargon is saying? Now, this was also the Global Fund. I have to talk about the Global Fund. And I'm happy to tell you, I think this is public information, that one of the architects of PEPFAR, an American named Dr. Mark Deibel, is going to be heading up the Global Fund, which is very good news uh, for all of us. This is one of the architects uh, of PEPFAR. So we made the argument to the Global Fund and later to PEPFAR, you need to find ways to take this vertical money and use it more horizontally. Again, public health jargon to strengthen systems. And what did that mean? It's easy to say. What it meant was going into run-down, dilapidated, or abandoned healthcare facilities, like this one, uh, and rebuilding them with, ostensibly, money that was targeted towards AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis. And the, the, the joke that we had internally was people would say, you know, what, isn't that mission creep? And we'd say, yeah, the mission is supposed to creep. You know, you're supposed to... I mean, you, don't, you can't have, you can have a national AIDS program, but what if someone has a broken arm? You're going to say, go down the street to the national broken arm program? It's right there. That's not how it works, in, in, even in a city. But it certainly doesn't work that way in a rural area. So that's what we did. And this is all to get ready for the earthquake story, which, as I said, is not, not that many of you in this room were, were, have worked in Haiti uh, around the earthquake. Um, but this is, we took that show the public-private partnerships funded by, again, vertical uh, dollars, much of it. A lot of it raised by Partners in Health for, you know, uh, what's called unrestricted use. So people would give us, you know, someone would send us in a check for $100 and not write, you have to do this with it. That was, that's how we sustain this work. But we also used this, these grants from foundations and from what are called bilateral, like the U.S. government, or multilateral, um, like a foundation, we use them to strengthen the system. And we did it all across Haiti, from the Dominican border to the coast. In, and and then one last point I'll make in, uh, about this model is we did that in the public sector. And that's, that was maybe the hardest discussion. Joya Mukherjee, again, the chief medical officer uh, at Partners in Health, was part of those discussions. She actually, uh, like, like me, she works for the Brigham and Harvard Medical School, and we volunteer at Partners in Health. We think that's a, a, an important way of, of doing this work. She and many others were involved with our Haitian colleagues saying, well, if the public sector is falling apart and we're growing, and we got, Haiti got one of the first large grants from the Global Fund, what, how can we join forces with the health ministry, the public sector? the Department of Health, as we'd call it here. How can we join forces and strengthen uh, each other mutually? And that's what we've tried to do, is to say, look, we're an NGO, Partners in Health. The Haitian name is Zamila Sante. And I work for another NGO in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And that, 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 nobody laughs here. At Brown, they would have <laughs> chuckled a little bit. And, but we're going to go into the public health sector and help rebuild it. That was our MO. And again, it was, people asked us, later, what's, your, what's, your strat what's your strategic plan? That was the strategic plan, to go into the public sector, rebuild it, and sweep across the country like some kind of Ponzi scheme for good. <laughs> and then came the earthquake. And everybody who works in Haiti, and a lot of people who don't, will remember where they were. This is 4.53 in the afternoon. And, and uh, you know, it, it was, as, as you all know by now, a, a devastating uh, turn of events in many ways. Um, first of all, the, it was the most crowded part of Haiti. 
Port-au-Prince, the capital city, is a very densely populated area, three million people probably living uh, in, in the s suburban sprawl and city. Um, and, and again, many of you have been there. That's where the epicenter wasn't too far from there. But even if the epicenter had been farther away, what, what it revealed is, of course, the poor quality of construction in Haiti. And you know, there have been warnings, and uh, it just didn't, it's hard to pay attention to warnings, right? It, it, there's so much, even here in this country, you know, I thought we saw a pretty spectacular uh, preparedness in some way to, for Sandy, but it's hard to do. You know, people don't want to be told to, you know, fix their house or move out or prepare. You know, I, and they, just, we, they don't like it. And uh, in Haiti, they don't like it, and they can't do it in the sense that they didn't have the public sector capacity. Again, just like in the clinics and hospitals, didn't have a public sector capacity. You can't outsource and privatize all of the public safety investments in any setting. So this was, a, I hope, a wake-up call. Um, it was certainly a terrible thing, uh, even if it were a wake-up call. This is the nursing school, by the way. Um, and you can imagine that for the students in the classrooms at that time, again, five in the afternoon, and their teachers, uh, very few of them survived the earthquake. And without even thinking about, about those people, which I do all the time, mostly young women, what about the nurses that are needed to, for the future? You know, rebuilding that kind of capacity uh, is going to take a lot of time and a lot of accompaniment. And, uh, and for all those who've, who've helped the company already, thank you. So this was hard to get our arms around from inside the quake zone. Now that's another thing is when you're, and, and again, some of you were there, I know, and it was, it was very difficult to understand the enormity of what was happening, in part because communications were shut down, but I'm not, I don't think it was that so much in retrospect. It's that it was such a huge disaster. Um, and, you know, the, the, nobody knew how many people have been lost. Uh, how, how would you know such a thing in the, in the middle of a place that's, you know, really been so uh, leveled? We could see a lot of visible signs, but there are also other kinds of toll that were taken by this earthquake. Uh, this is, I saw this slide. This is the National Palace, which, you, as you know, was uh, destroyed. But I saw this slide, I think, I, I remember, it was something like, uh, it was maybe two weeks after the earthquake. Uh, the 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 Inter-American Development Bank, I believe it was, made this slide in comparing a number of other earthquakes and natural disasters. And, and in, I remember looking at this thing, oh, well, that's why it's so difficult to process. It's because it was just so large in terms of lo lives lost and damage done. And I, I, you know, lots of ways of counting it. The obvious way is uh, people lost. But also, Haiti had a very weak federal infrastructure to start with, literally the infrastructure. Um, there, there are not buildings like the one, the beautiful buildings here at URI. Um, there were about 29 federal buildings. This is a beautiful building. The, Pal the National Palace uh, of Haiti was a beautiful building. Uh, and of the 29, 28 were leveled, damaged, or sort. So there was no Ministry of Health. There was no Ministry of Justice. There was no, you know, the Supreme Court, Parliament, Palace. Those symbols of society, in a way, uh, were also destroyed. Uh, that was not the primary uh, source of commentary that I heard in those days. Of course, it was more about uh, it was more about families and loved ones who were lost. But it, nonetheless, uh, the the blow dealt was so enormous on so many different levels. Now there was a good response in some ways. I would I would I think it's fair to say that the um, well. Let me just put it this way. I'll just give you some numbers and not make assertions. I'm told that more than half of all American households donated to Haiti earthquake relief, which which we felt down there um, in the middle of it. And um, a lot of, you know, you, we can look back and say the money was not spent in a way that would build Haitian institutions, but that's true of any kind of uh, emergency response. And there's a, it could have been done, done a lot better, I have no doubt. And I've tried to go through the data um, uh, in terms of uh, emergency relief, but also reconstruction pledges. Go through the data. We've actually posted the data on a website um, uh, called the, uh, President Clinton encouraged us to do it, and we did. And 
So we know that the money that was pledged for reconstruction wasn't really always pledged in a way that would uh, favor rebuilding or building Haitian institutions. We still have a lot of work to do to repair that. But all in all, I mean, the, and again, for if I can just, for the doctors and nurses and um, and pharmacists and all of the people who came down uh, just to help deal with the immediate in the injuries, um, I think um, it was a, it was there was moments of great um, generosity and heroism there, and I I, I know that there are many pe many lives were saved uh, because of the. In outpouring of assistance, um, and, and I'm particularly proud, if I may, of the uh, medical community, meaning the clinicians, doctors, and nurses who uh, were very present and, and, and quick to understand that the problems in Haiti were not only at an acute earthquake, but an earthquake, an acute event that struck uh, a setting with chronic insufficiencies in terms of public infrastructure, including healthcare infrastructure. Now, that is what we call in medicine an acute on chronic problem, right? So if someone has diabetes, then they get, you know, a urinary tract infection. That's an acute problem, an acute infection on top of a chronic problem, diabetes. And it's a metaphor, of course, but it, it's, it, it's not a bad one. Um, because and let me give the example of, uh, of housing. It's how, Haiti has had a chronic housing crisis. That's why it has so many informal settlements. You saw what happened when a major infrastructure project, a hydroelectric dam, was built. People became homeless. By the way, that dam was the largest buttress dam in the Western Hemisphere when it was built. It wasn't built only by Haitian companies. It was built by with international financing. A lot of, but there were still homeless communities all along the flooded valley. And that's what it was like after the earthquake. We, the earthquake did not create the housing crisis, crisis or the construction quality crisis in Haiti. It only revealed them. And that's why the work of accompaniment in Haiti, if we're really going to build back better, will require many, many years and, and a serious reversal of our ADD approach to uh, both disaster relief and development assistance. And I'm going to just give <clears throat> a couple of examples. Uh, the number of uh, still in camps, maybe 400,000, I'm not sure what the number is, is um, it, it's not, it, it's obviously not good all this time after the earthquake to still have people in camps. Um, at, at the same time, it's in, in some parts of the world, for refugees from war, the average time an internally displaced person faces or a displaced person faces in a camp is on the order of a dozen years. So, uh, the, again, these are reflections of acute on chronic problems. And then just one, and to, I'll open this up shortly for uh, broader discussion. One of the, uh, it's not, cholera is not a qu consequence of the earthquake. Uh, cholera, a cholera introduction is uh, surely, it's, it's transnational, right? Because if you're living on an island that's never had cholera, then you have to you introduce the same thing happened with HIV, right? Or any other pathogen, uh, it gets introduced, and that happened, and there's all kinds of brouhaha, which I'm sure you've heard about the introduction. It's not unreasonable to believe that uh, peacekeepers from cholera endemic areas, which are listed on this map, uh, int introduced this, ba this bacterium. Uh, and it's, it's, it's of some import, but the really interesting questions are really about how to stop the epidemic, not where did it come from. And that was true around HIV uh, as well as... as I argued in another one of my best-selling books 20-something years ago, and again, I'm sure you've all read it. Um, but this is how behind everybody was and unprepared for this acute on chronic complication of not the earthquake, but of water insecurity. We've been writing about this for years, but you know, writing about it is not the same as actually doing something about it. Although one hopes that action can be informed by sound analysis. But our colleagues... Um, at the World Health Organization had a map of cholera and they, the speed of cholera spread in Haiti and the size of the epidemic was so enormous that it, out, it outpaced even the capacity of PowerPoint gurus to make a map of it. So you just see at the top it says, and then there's Haiti over here uh, with the largest epidemic. And this is the largest epidemic of cholera in the world today probably. 
Um, and uh, it, it spread uh, not because of some cultural practices or anything like that, not at all. It spread because there's water insecurity in Haiti. And you cannot be sure when you take water from a source, whether it be a spring or, a, uh, or even a faucet, that, it, that it's, it's clean. And, uh, and so this is another one of those acute on chronic problems. Now, I want to, I wanna, and th this is a tr tracing the epidemic, which l let me just again go back to the concept of failure. Uh, I started with that, and I want to close with it. Um, with a, a comment on failure and a, uh, a more promising development that I hope you will be part of in some way. But this cholera epidemic uh, exploded right in the area where Partners in Health had been working for a long time. So it was very humbling to know that the very place where you've invested all your time and energy and treasure, meaning Partners in Health, and me personally as well, is the place where cholera exploded. Because the interventions that we have been engaged in, which are largely, as I showed you, building healthcare infrastructure and training healthcare colleagues, that doesn't stop a cholera epidemic. A cholera epidemic is stopped by modern waste management systems and municipal water systems. Unless, of course, everybody, you know, is going to buy Dasani. Dasani, uh, they must be raking it in, I gotta say. I, not just because the first lady's here, I want to say I would be happy to drink Rhode Island tap water. But you can't do that in Haiti. So unless everybody is going to have, be drinking out little plastic bottles from you know, a, um, a commercial distributor, which is what the non-Haitians do. I mean, when I'm down there, uh, an hour or two doesn't go by when, before someone hands me uh, an unopened bottle of a plastic water bottle like this in Haiti. But that's not available to poor people. So in this area where we'd been working, not including in Mirbalé, believe it or not. Again, the town I asked you to remember the name uh, is, is Mirbalé. This exploded like a bomb. It went from Mirbalé right down the biggest river system, the same one that was dammed up all those years ago, and to the coast at San Marc, and then out to the rest of the country. And we could certainly save a lot of lives. And again, we did, because once you can identify, I and mean, cholera often has a pretty distinctive presentation, um, meaning acute, explosive diarrhea. Um, not always, but often enough so that you can, if you can identify people quickly and treat them, you'll save their lives. Case fatality rate, meaning the number of people who die with cholera who have proper treatment is close to zero. And it was probably 20% in the first days. And we were, everybody was so overwhelmed even after we knew it was cholera, which was on October 22nd, we still couldn't keep up because we just weren't, first of all, people were hard to find, they were hard to get into the centers, and you know, people were, instead of trying to rehydrate them orally, were, uh, the doctors and nurses were putting in lines, some, meaning IVs, and some people couldn't, they were vomiting, and they, they were too far gone, so a lot of people died. More people have died of cholera in Haiti than in any other epidemic in the world today, probably um, more than 8,000, 9,000. I, mean, I haven't, I, I don't know if I have the latest number in. I do have the la uh, latest number in. So this is a huge epidemic, and again, is an epidemic that could only have been prevented by having modern sanitation available. And that's still a task before all those who would accompany Haiti today, who would walk with, with the Haitian people. And, 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 I, and it's something I think the Haitians are inviting us to do. They would like, of course, us not to have so many different groups working there. It's very hard for the public authorities to, to make heads or tails of these uh, myriad interventions. And that requires some discipline on our part uh, as, as people who care about Haiti, but also care about public health and public education. And as the P word is in there, is public. And we're not in a, you know, we're, we may be a private NGO, but it, that was the point that we discovered far too long ago in our medical work. There's got to be ways to strengthen the public health system. In this case, it's the public water system. Now, how have we done that? And I won't, I'm sure you all read The Lancet every week, and I know you read our paper. And I will. One of the things that we've done is to try and learn from this painful experience. Uh, and this is the we, Partners in Health working with the public authorities, the Ministry of Health, um, rolled out the first cholera vaccine 
uh, rollout, I'm not going to call it a trial because it was a well already tried, in, uh, in the Americas. When I was a young man, I started working in Peru uh, at the tail end of a cholera epidemic, the last big uh, uh, epidemic of, of cholera in the, in the uh, Americas was uh, 1991, 92, 93. Uh, in South America and, and Central America, another very huge and often explosive epidemic. There was more water security uh, in, in Lima than in Lima 1991 than in Peru, but there were still serious sanitation problems in Lima because it, there was, again, all sorts of reasons that people were leaving the, the hills and going into the cities and to live in slums like the the ones we saw after the earth, uh, one we saw in, in Port-au-Prince before the earthquake. So this we'll try to keep uh, learning from, um, how to do a better job to integrate prevention and care. It's a very similar story to what we described with AIDS uh, 15 years earlier. And then I'd like to, again, as I said, open this up for discussion on a fairly positive note. One of the things that uh, has been disturbing uh, but not surprising is that there are a lot, there were so many promises made uh, to Haiti after the earthquake, and now we're hearing a lot about what people are calling donor fatigue. I feel like saying, "You think the donors are fatigued? Try being, you know, the Haitians." And I'll, I'll get, although it's not helpful to say things like that, so I'm trying to stop. <laughs> um, but that's what I'm really thinking. So, the notion of accompaniment. Is, is helpful here as well because how, I, saw, I showed you the picture of the nursing school destroyed. How long will it take to build up the capacity even to the level where it was um, uh, of, of training uh, the nurses we need and the physicians and, and, and what kind of facilities do we need to train them? If that's the beginning of a conversation rather than the end of one, then you're saying, instead of saying, well, how long is it going to take? You're saying, how long will that take? And that's the, those are the questions we need to ask. What will it take for us to be good accompaniateurs to accompany the Haitian people as they rebuild? And these lessons are not just for Haiti. I mean, they're for, you know, look at the debates going on uh, around uh, Sandy. And, uh, you know, in the New York Times today, there's, or yesterday, um, there are articles about how sometimes rebuilding in these same places is not a good idea. You know? And these are serious questions about how to improve our practice uh, that could be useful in many places. So this is one of the answers we had. Uh, you remember the model, it's community-based care, health centers, and hospitals. And it's not that you can just do one part of that. If you have good partners, you can do one part of it. If you had the hospital people working on the hospitals and clinic people working on the clinic, and the community-based care people working on it, that would be great. And then you could imagine a setting where that's either present or coming online. Rwanda has been uh, a model of uh, improvement over the last decade in terms of people thought after the genocide in 1994 that Rwanda would never recover. That it was the poorest country of the world with a million dead and millions more refugees and deep enmity that it would never recover. Well, it is recovering. And, you know, that's another um, source of inspiration for a lot of people working in Haiti is Rwanda. They've recovered because they've had a plan that tries to find all the partners needed for long-term accompaniment. They might not use that language, uh, but that's very much, I believe, uh, what they've done. So part of what we're trying to do is to uh, put in place modern, a modern teaching hospital that is really focused on the task of delivering services at the same time that we're teaching. And that's the way, you know, the hospitals that I trained in here in, in Boston, that's what they do. They're, they're built as teaching institutions. And you need space to do that. And oh, by the way, maybe it should be not, maybe it should be solar powered. Uh, maybe it should have the space built into the plan the first time around, not like we did it in 1984 or even 2006, 7, 8, as we rebuilt. Maybe you should actually have real architects. That was a now, the thing that worried me, um, and has worried a lot of people, is there have been a lot of promises made, but a lot of things, I didn't even know what a charrette was. But here at URI, you have people who build charrettes. A lot of charrettes, not a lot of real projects that are done. But I'm proud to tell you that as of last Thursday, 
This hospital became the largest solar-powered hospital in the developing world today as the solar panels came online. Now, as my colleagues um, have said very often, building a hospital is not the same as running one. That's where you can come in. So for all of you who are Partners in Health supporters, and some of you who are not but will become Partners in Health supporters, or to the generation of students, um, including those I've shanghaied from Brown, uh, who care about global health, we would just invite you to join us in one way or the other. It doesn't have to be Partners in Health. It doesn't have to be Haiti. It can be Rhode Island. There are health disparities right here. And actually, there are a number of people from this university and, and, and Brown and others who work on health disparities. Um, there are health disparities everywhere in the world. And I'm going to close by making the argument that this problem, the problem of health disparities, will be, be seen as the ranking human rights problems of our times. That and probably the, the climate change that we only dimly understand. These are going to be the big problems that your generation will have to face. And that is the per focus, of course, of this colloquium and this series. And I'm very proud to be a part of it and, of course, very grateful also. Thank you very much. I was going to say, someone is doing this remotely because I didn't even touch it. <laughs> How do you incorporate foreign professionals to assist in short-term recovery in Haiti while building for the independent capacity in the future? Did you say foreign professionals, non-Haitians? Is that what it said? That's what oh, it says. There. Oh, foreign professionals, okay. Well, I think the, the I have some friends here. Thank you, by the way, those of you who have to leave. I know I went a little bit over. I have some friends here who are nurses and physicians. Um, who've gone to Haiti, and they know that, that it would be the longer we have, the, first of all, um, the model that we've put together of having uh, American hospitals partner long term is not, not a bad one, especially if we make long term commitments. We, we have done with the Clinton Foundation and the um, Ministry of Health of Rwanda, we've been working for years on, on launching a project called Human Resources for Health which is actually sending, including from uh, Rhode Island, sending about 100 health profe professional teachers, doctors and uh, professors of nursing and, and medicine, to Rwanda. That's the largest transfer of medical training capacity uh, to Sub-Saharan Africa, probably, that's ever happened, at least in that part of Africa, and I think probably the whole continent. So that's one way, the longer term, a year or two. But for people like my, I have a friend here, a skilled nurse from the Brigham, people with those kind of skills know how to run an ICU, surgical uh, subspecialties. I, I would say there's almost a spectrum on the one end that's very context dependent. Uh, many people would argue that psychiatry is very context dependent. And on the other, you know, urology. Prostate is a prostate is a prostate. No, I'm just, I shouldn't say that. I'm, not, I'm a professor of social medicine. But surgery, radiology, where shorter term engagements um, could make more sense. I, I think that's true. But the biggest problem we need to understand is that we have a great mission, there's great need, but managing that is quite difficult to do. So it requires also a lot of patience, real patience and, and you know, sticking with it. Of course, the subtext here is that this is medical education. You're providing services, but also teaching people. There are so many small, successful NGOs doing great things in Haiti, yet working individually. Do you see these as a benefit, or would a collaborative effort be more productive? Wow, and it says less than a minute ago. That, that, that scares me a little bit. <laughs> um, well, I, I, think, I think it's a tough call, which is one of the first parts of an honest discussion, to say the very fact that you wouldn't know the answer to that is, is troubling, right? And there's a, uh, I met a, um, a physician who's here tonight, and she made a s small uh, film about this very topic, which I haven't seen yet, but I'll try to look at later on tonight, um, in which I think it is argued that there's so many small, little organizations that are uncoordinated with the larger effort that it's more harm than good. And that may be true. Now, the, the Haitian government has, 
asked us to slow down with our critique of NGOs, interestingly enough, to ask me personally, directly. It's like, wait, I thought I was doing it for you guys and gals. But I, I get why they hinted at me to do that, to slow down, because there's a lot of goodwill that you find in these NGOs and a lot of, and that, that is worth something. So, you know, the, and the solidarity that I mentioned after the earthquake was very uh, uh, profound. But we do desperately need to coordinate uh, activity. The Rwandans were very um, tough on, about this after the genocide. They said, here's our national plan. If you don't like it, well, there are other countries you can work in. And one of my best friends is from Burundi, and he said, they all came to Burundi. Mm. So I think that we need to coordinate. It's easier said than done, but I think there are forums now and collectives where people can... I'll give the example of Mirbale. We're not asking the Kellogg Foundation to go and build a, build a teaching hospital in Mirbale. I'm looking at you like you asked all the questions, when I know you're just reading them. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we're not saying to the Kellogg Foundation, go build a, you know... A teaching hospital. We're saying Partners in Health has more expertise in healthcare infrastructure. What what can other groups, you know, microfinance organization like Fonc Jose, you know, you can uh, ag people with agricultural capacity developing small businesses, large businesses, solar power, on and on it goes. The real trick is is bringing people together and keeping them focused on these problems for long enough. The Haitians are committed, right? They live there. It's their country, and you know they're. They're committed to their country, the, many of them, and the, certainly the ones I work with. I told you I still work with the same people. So it's really we've got to get over this ADD in development um, or medicate it properly. Okay, that was a metaphor. Next question. Obama needs your advice. What would you do to fix health care woes in our country? Where and how can we better realize and company run? Excuse me. I, I just got to have to take a call from President Obama real quick. <laughs> I'm busy right now, sir. I'll call you back. Um, I, I, yeah, the message hasn't reached me. Who, who asked the question? I should do that. Anyway, the message hasn't reached me yet. Um, you know, I, I've been struck in reading more about this. First of all, as a doctor, I ought to know, I, I ought to know a lot more about the, how to answer this question. But I've been struck in reading um, the work of some of my friends and colleagues, including those who went to Washington, like Don Berwick, um, or people who are looking at, you know, just the numbers, running the numbers. Uh, not the numbers that we talked about earlier, that maybe 10 to 20 percent of health care outcomes are determined by the medical care that you give. I don't think that we shouldn't know that as providers. It's just we should understand that doesn't mean that it's a wasted effort to be a doctor or a nurse or a health care worker. Of course not. But I've also been struck that People with chronic illnesses, serious ailments, you know, there are people who, who have, as they used to call it, I hope they stopped doing this, pre-existing conditions, you know, that are really difficult and expensive to manage. So one thing that I'm hoping, as a, not as a lay person, because I'm a physician, but as a health policy lay person, is that the formula includes universal access to care. Because as long as we have in this country, some people who have access to care and others who don't, it's, gonna, it's an equity problem. So I would say we need to stick with this commitment to expanding access to everyone who lives in, on these shores. And <clears throat> another is, of course, that and anybody who runs a hospital, and there's a couple of people in here who do run hospitals, knows that there are a lot of misaligned incentives, right? Um, and meaning people are rewarded, physicians, and, and I get, we get spared this to some extent in a teaching hospital like the Brigham, but people are rewarded for not for promoting and preserving health, but rather for the number of procedures or diagnostic tests they do. That doesn't really make much sense. Um, and the argument in the 20 or 30 years ago was much more impoverished than it is now, the debates. They're actually getting more sophisticated. It's pretty slow, but they're getting more sophisticated as people say, okay, how can we provide high quality care to everybody who needs it and reward ourselves for making them be better? And some of you have read Atul Gawande's paper, The Hot Spotter, or read about some of the people who are actually trying to tackle the really toughest patients in our system, and the way doctors talk, toughest patients meaning they have the toughest, toughest illnesses. 
and multiple illnesses. I just want to say one, one last thing, um, which I would say to any healthcare guru, including uh, and the president's team, is when we talk about a medical home, we still aren't really talking about home-based care. So we're still not even at that point in the debate when we say home, we mean someone's house. Medical home, as the current jargon, it just means where you get your primary care. But I've described a model that I think would work well in this country, and that is we need to link community-based care to health centers and hospitals, knowing that any, and at different stages in life's trajectory, you're going to need one or all of those. You know, I, I had, you know, I walked in front of a car. You know how your mother says, look both ways before you cross the street? Do what your mother says, okay, students? When I was a Harvard medical student, I should have known better. Uh, I walked right in front of a car. So, you know, that is not the time for me to receive community-based care for multiple orthopedic fractures. I wanted inpatient orthopedic care, which I got, you know. But then, if, you know, if, you know, 20 years later, you know, I'm, I'm don't, or 30 years later, I can't get organized enough to get my antihypertensive medications. That's a different kind of problem. So I do believe this model uh, that we, I love, and what's the part of the model that's missing? It's really the community-based care part. Community-based care for chronic disease, including major mental illness, a lot of the complications of, uh, that we, a lot of the chronic diseases we see, is, makes much more sense than the system we have now. And we, we should push it forward. And we can push it forward based on expenditure arguments, but notice I haven't even brought those up. I've only brought up the quality argument. The quality, the value proposition has to be front and center in American healthcare debates. What is the value to patients? And not what is the cost recovery for the health insurance companies. And again, I'm not trying to single out, uh, there. everybody's involved in this and we, we need to be more focused on, on the value of the, of the product, if we want to use that language. Next question. Many Haitian physician and nurses leave Haiti. What will keep them in Haiti, and can they make a livable income within the current medical system? Great, great question. And in fact, the number is probably that 80% leave. So, um, and, and they don't leave because they don't care about their country. When I was a young man, 25 years ago, I didn't understand this very well. I know a lot more about it now. Why? Because I'm friends with the doctors and nurses, and I know why they leave. And so the, part of it is their salaries. No, they cannot make a livable in income unless they work for an NGO or as consultants for a, a USAID contract or something like that. It's really hard for them to, to make a living. And they certainly can't make a living in the public sector where we've invested our energies. So, but that's not the only thing. They also, that's why I told that story. I don't know if uh, someone wants to fess up who asked the question, but I can look at you if that would be fitting. In any case, um, as I described the young doctor I work with, you know, I'm always wondering if he'll be listening one of these days to some talk I give, and he'll think I don't describe him charitably, which I hope is not the case. He got burnt out because he didn't have any system behind him, and he did get burnt out. And uh, so they need a system behind them. So it's not just the salary. It's they need labs. They need the things that we would consider de rigueur, not just for a hospital like Miriam or, you know, uh, anyone around here, but, but in a clinic. You know, you'd expect access to lab and a list of medications or the patient to be able to fill. So that's another part of it, improving the quality of their working environment. And also, who can see 200 patients a day? I, not this guy, and not me. I, ca I can't see, I can't, I can't do it. And you may be able to do it for a little while, but I think the amount of time you could see that many patients and be sane is, can be measured in weeks or months and not years. So we need to build programs, if I may, like the Mirabale Teaching Hospital, where you're going to say, we're going to drag up the quality of care, because the quality and value proposition is what's most important in healthcare debates. We'll drag up the quality of care by dragging up the quality of the infrastructure and link that to better training and more time uh, um, for, for, for every patient and more backup laboratories. This, is, this hospital has the first CAT scanner in a public facility in all of Haiti. It'll have the first CAT scanner in rural Haiti, period. So th that, I hope that is the answer to the, the shorthand answer that I would say, one word, Mirabale. 
Dr. Farmer, I see you more as a development worker than just a health worker, hence this question. What do you say to the idea of using the disaster as a springboard for a total rebuilding of the entire Haiti economy, for instance, through extensive public work programs? I think it, it would still be great. It was, uh, it was a great idea during the, the storms. You know, Haiti was pummeled by four hurricanes just the year before the quake. And we started talking about it then, you know. I, again, it was probably not a good idea to call it the New New Deal. I thought it was charming, though. I'm kind of an FDR guy myself. Anyway, it was a great idea then. It became even more great as an idea. I don't know if anybody wants to gesture who asked the question, but it was a great idea after the quake, and I still think it's a great idea. Um, first of all, we have billions of dollars going into aid in Haiti, so making that aid more effective, I think some of it would, it would be great to have more public works programs that could generate a lot of jobs and, and transfer some of that money, or more of that money, I'm not saying none of it is, transfer that money into Haitian families through jobs creation. That's, that's a, one of the best ways to attack um, persistent unemployment and build public infrastructure and not waste um, foreign assistance. I'm all for it. And, and you could, you know, you can see, you just see the impact of improved roads in Haiti over the last years since, since, since you were there last. It's very, uh, it's very important. Very, it opens up things for people, who peasant farmers or farmers who have really small holdings to move their markets to, to move their goods to market. You can imagine building, again, I said more small businesses. I think breaking that cycle of poverty and disease could really be sped up by more investments in big public works projects. Has Partners in Health as an international external player faced any obstacles and or opposition from the Haitian government slash politics? Well, sure. I mean, all of our existence. Partners in Health was started at a time when there was a family dictatorship in Haiti. So the epiphany that I mentioned when in, uh, from 1986 to 2002, we didn't really have many uh, public works projects in the public sector. There is a reason for that, which we don't have to be embarrassed about. I think it was, it was because we wanted, didn't want to work with the, the dictatorship uh, too closely, right? And I'm sure people imagine if you were working in, uh, there was actually a professor from, uh, from Rhode Island who wrote a great uh, book about this called Aiding Violence, Peter Yuvin. Uh, and it's just talking about the, uh, before the genocide in Rwanda, how the formal aid sector did work cozily with the government and helped set the stage, he argued, for genocide. So we had our reasons. Um, but, but that said, once we decided, you know, and this is after the first democratic elections in Haiti, to try and work with the government, it's, it's worth um, some pain and struggle to do that. Because let me make a, a rights-based argument. I've made it before. Um, and that is that if you believe in the right to health care or the right to vote or the right to do anything, any of these basic rights, political, civil, social, economic, who confers rights? The right to education, you know, in Little Compton, Rhode Island. Is there a Little Compton? There's no big Compton? <laughs> My daughter goes to school here, so I'm, I'm getting to know the little towns. The right to health care is conferred by the public sector. There's no right to go to URI or, or, uh, or Harvard, you know. Or, so we need, we, need, we need to find a way to have not apolitical in a bad sense, but to be protected, shielded as an organization to some extent from the buffeting winds. And it's been very difficult. Now, is, that, is it so difficult that we want to give up? No, I don't think so. Um, I, I don't know... Um, what the director of PIH Haiti is a, her mother's here tonight. Kate Oswald is my colleague in Haiti, and uh, I can I can say with some confidence that my and of course she works with the even larger Haitian organizations. I mean that's what I'm saying. I don't think any of them is in the least bit interested in giving up on this effort to help rebuild public capacity in Haiti. Even though of course we have had lots of troubles over the years, and uh, and it's been very painful often and personally painful as well. Um, and I'm sure, again, anytime you go into a place, like uh, we had problems in Guatemala and problems in Peru and problems in a lot of the places we work. Actually, we didn't have a lot of problems in Russia, interestingly. That was one of the places where many other NGOs have had problems. 
you know, and we, they regard us, the Russians, as, you know, even-handed technocrats who are trying to work in the prison system with them. You'd think we'd be the first ones to go, right, working in the prisons, but never, never run afoul of them. And what do we do? We're promoting the right to health care for prisoners. So part of it is also because we are there doing the work and delivering the services and building the hospitals and building the clinics, we, we, it's not saying we get a pass, but I think there's, on all sides of the political spectrum, there's some respect for doctors and nurses and community health workers and people delivering the services. We are going to use that as our only shield. And we've had problems and failures and tragedies before, and we'll have some in the future. But I assume that is the nature of social justice work. Unfortunately, the last question. In your opinion, what is the most... Unfortunately for you, I, I'm going to be... I want another hour to answer. <laughs> We got them. All right. Uh, what, what is the most... One more. I'm kidding. <laughs> <clears throat> what is the most effective way for non-healthcare professionals or even students to become involved with the goals of organizations like Partners in Health? Well, you know, uh, again, I think the, the most effective way is to find a way to do that here uh, or if you're at URI or wherever you are listening or you're at Brown. Let me give an example. Um, Student activism. I met today um, the head of Face Aid or one of the Face Aids leaders here. Where, where, where are you? When is, there you are. Is it Sh Shayla? Hey, I remembered. So Face Aids is a good example, if I may. Face Aids is an, a student organization that isn't only focused on AIDS. I mean, how many of you are involved in Face Aids? Because I would encourage more students to get involved in that or other organizations. So student activism takes all kinds of different forms now. Um, some of it's pretty, pretty pragmatic. Face Aids has helped, I mean, from their f humble beginnings, at, actually at Stanford, so it's nothing humble about Stanford. Um, from their humble beginnings uh, some years ago, I, I would just, I'll, I won't imagine, take a guess because I'm going to tell you how much money this group of students, mostly eight, some high school students, but mostly college students, has raised for our work, including our work in Rwanda. $2.6 million. That's a lot of money. So we, we've, in, we've invited the, one of the founders of Face Aids to join the board of Partners in Health. He's still in his 20s. You know, we have deep respect for the pragmatism of students who are busy with other things, including classes, one hopes, and doing their reading. Although I'm, I'm not always sure at Harvard. But um, we, 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 we have a great deal of respect for that kind of pragmatism. Now that may sound self-serving, because Face Aids has been so generous to Partners in Health. But it, I don't think it matters which group you're supporting. It's rather that you're doing something. And don't feel, I, I mean, look, this is a very beautiful campus with late 19th century buildings in towering granite, right? And you, you can feel like you're cut off from the world, but you're not. And then there's also local activism. As I said, health disparities, problems people have right here in the, around in Rhode Island. You know, a lot of students are involved in local activism and engagement. And then the, the thing that I would say most is the real trick is just starting early and sticking with it. So the earlier, and I've met now some um, of my friends who are here from Brown, I actually met them when they were in middle school or junior high, and they've been supporting our work and become friends of ours way before I ever, you know, way before I ever thought of it. I thought of this, getting involved in this work at college, not in high school or before that, and I'm starting to meet younger and younger people getting involved. And that means in a way that you just have more literacy in this arena. You get better at analysis, you get to be more discerning, and so I say start early, stick with it, and assume that it is going to be the work of you know, many, many years. Well, I, I, I will say, in, by way of one last thank you, that this is my um, 30th year doing this work, 25th year as PIH, and I take out of an evening like this a lot of inspiration. The work is not easy, and, uh, and, and it is rewarding. The direct uh, contact is rewarding, but it does require a lot of support. Um, and coming to URI and coming back to Rhode Island has been a real treat for me, and I just want to thank you all for having me here. Thank you. <laughs>